course, has always been a problem, particularly since the 90s. And whatever it takes to create a more balanced spending situation, it is to an extent well. Um, however, the real point is there was a, there was a very strong bargain, and there still is, provided the United States is still think it has an interest in that. The US provides security, the Europeans provide loyalty. And it's not just loyalty, it's not just support for your foreign policy in all multilateral forums, in all multilateral communication negotiations, sometimes providing men, soldiers, money, and stuff. It provides also your territory. This country is full of US bases, and it is a, and it is a fundamental asset in the US capacity to project power into the Mediterranean, the Middle East, and Africa, uh, and actually even beyond that. So, the military spending issue, I don't want to downgrade its importance because it is very important. But the story is not that some members are good and some members are free like respondents. It's much more complicated than that. And the United States power has overwhelming, overwhelmingly benefited from that. The difference between Trump and the other and the other presidents, all of which have always complained with the Europeans about their barbarian, the Brits, the French, of course, and a few others, uh, regarding their, their, their uh, um, insufficient level of military spending. The difference is that Trump seemed to question the existence of a common interest, of a common strategic interest, which took fit with, on which that bargain, the US providing security to the Europeans' loyalty was based. I think he might be having second thoughts, I mean, perhaps his instincts certainly are telling something different, but you know, who knows. Uh, regarding the Brexit issue, it's not the institutions that could pose a fair trade, it's that unfortunately that we are uh, going into a negotiation in which the common interests uh, might be identified in functional terms. But politically, it's very different. Politically, the Brexit negotiation risks becoming a zero-sum game, particularly because of the excessive level of politicization that the Brexit issue has been subjected to in the UK, uh, which bears huge responsibilities for setting the tone of this uh, Brexit negotiation in, in, in such a way that uh, expectations will never be fulfilled, not because of the Commission, but because, it, because while it is in Italy's interest, in Germany's interest, in all 27 member states' interest, having a very, and this is a point the Germans have been, have been telling the Brits openly, publicly, for months, it seems that the Brits are still in a state of denial. Okay, um, let's move to Mitchell and for the final report. So um, I think I agree with everybody more or less on the point about uh, NATO spending, but maybe you should add that um, there's been a bill passed around uh, Congress for about uh, 15 years about disbanding NATO, and you know sometimes it's you know more prevalent, sometimes it's withdrawn, and I think it's something that American decision makers are in some ways always playing with since the end of the Cold War um, because. The raison d'etre of having the alliance um, has changed. That said, I think that um, from Bill Clinton, uh, George Bush, uh, Obama, there's been at least uh, an acknowledgement that, you know, as, as was noted, the territory and the use of uh, NATO territory for the expansion of uh, American sphere, the American sphere of influence, uh, as well as you know, kind of uh, platforms for NATO missions, has been vitally important. But I should also perhaps add that Donald Trump has also assumed the presidency in the United States at a time when the European Union is discussing openly having a European army. And I think that people in Washington are asking, like, why can't you afford to contribute to NATO but you can afford to talk about a European army? Um, where is that money going to come from? And then the discussion is, you better invest it in NATO or NATO is going to disappear. Because ultimately, you have a European army. It's called NATO. Um, the basis 
of NATO is about European defense. It's not about engagement in Afghanistan, and it's certainly not about an engagement in Libya. It's about European defense. So if now we start to use NATO to launch operations into Afghanistan and forget about using um, Af to use NATO uh, for what it's intended, then you know um, it, that's a, that's a problem. Together also with you know the fact that even the V4 group, the Visegrad Four of Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland have already started to create their own operational centers in in Central Europe. So why and how come they can't afford the 2% but they can develop a battle group uh, in Central Europe that is separate from NATO command? And, and I think that's a problem. Um, in terms of economic development and, uh, yeah, of course, um, if you look at the Middle East and you look at economic development, um, and I, I would say economic development more than democracy as we understand it, um, there are different systems with different speeds of uh, change. But if you look at where people are coming from to, uh, in terms of migration, they're not coming from Saudi Arabia. You don't get very many Saudi migrants to Europe who are trying to, you know, move move into a European system. Uh, Saudis are rel they relatively have a, a solid economic uh, base. You don't find Qataris picking up and moving, you know, as migrants. Uh, you find people from the poorest parts of the of the uh, region. So we do have to, I think, tackle you know socioeconomic and political uh, issues that are plaguing the the South Mediterranean. Thank you everyone uh, for staying with us. Uh, it's been a pleasure and uh, um, definitely let's uh, uh, stay uh, hung out and uh, 